Yeah, I think originally we were going to call the film Sketching and Steel, weren't we? Mm. Because that's kind of what we do. Um, I think it was re- it was a kind of an exercise in design, really, wasn't it? That it was, was the sort of main starting point. Partly that we wanted to kind of combine two bits of the film. So the process of making the tooling, the process of making the product, and then actually going to go and visit Sean up at Broadway, um to kind of go and give it purpose. So I think quite a lot of the stuff I've been writing about on Instagram recently is that, um, you know, all the stuff we make, it's just bits of metal until it's given a purpose. I think that's part of what we're trying to do in the films, is to, to show the process of making, but also what happens to it after something's been made. But we couldn't forge these spoon swages on our own. No. We couldn't, so it was gonna, it would have had to have taken two of us. I mean, in this instance, we sort of rotated a little bit. Uh, and I think I was striking for your spoon swage and you were striking for mine, so you'd have a little bit of a break in between. It's quite hard work. Um, you wouldn't physically be able to do it on your own, I don't think. You couldn't hold the block, hold the tooling, and strike with a sledgehammer. I'm sure you could find a way to do it, but it would take you a hell of a long time. So for us, you know, you've got two pieces heating up in the forges, you've got one person ready to strike, one person ready to lead, and you rotate, and you know, that way it makes it much more efficient. You get a much better end result. Um, and that is the traditional way of making swages. Mostly they're cast. I mean, so the big swage blocks are cast, and you can get spoon swages that are cast, and cast steel, cast iron. But these we made specifically for this particular item, or this, this particular product. Smith and Stryker is is the old fashioned power hammer. It was a job in and of itself in the days before you had big machinery. Um, you'd have a long line of Smiths working at anvils and there'd be uh, just a team of strikers sitting down with their sledgehammers waiting for a call from the Smith. And then they'd get the call, they'd run over, do whatever they were told and then run back and sit down again. It was a job in and of itself and it was it's a way to get more power, um, a heavier strike and to get a higher strike rate. So you've got two people striking in sequence, or more than two. This is the first time that we've made a film that we we haven't made the product before. So this was, in a sense, it's a new film, but it's also it's a new product. And part of the film is showing that creative process from start to finish. Yeah. No, we forged out the the spoon swages. I mean, that must have taken us four hours, I suppose, did it? Just uh, yeah, something like that, and done it all just with sledge and Smith and Striker. Um, yeah, and then I think after lunch we sat down and I thought, okay, right, well, we'll, we'll make some of the um, copper bowls now, and they just didn't work. And it just shows that, you know, you can plan something out in your mind and you think, right, well, we've made all these tools, and obviously it's going to work first time. And I think it must have been three or four or five attempts just to get the tooling right, just so we could get it into the kind of into the perfect shape that we wanted. So, yeah, not everything goes right first time.
I mean, a lot of the process that Joe and I go through of making a new product is a basic concept. I'll give you the basic concept. You might forge the original piece. I might then reforge it or not. Or I might forge a piece and then give it to you and you might alter it. So it's a very sort of collaborative process. I'm much better with a hammer than I am with a pen. So it's a lot easier for me, instead of trying to explain something through a drawing, it's easier for me to just make it. And then you can see it, you can feel it, you know the weight, you know the dimensions. And instead of trying to draw something in 3D to show you all the different dimensions, it's a lot easier for me to just make it. Yeah, just go straight into the material. And I think that's what we enjoy, especially as the Smiths, kind of straight into the hot steel, um, you can see how it reacts, you can see, well certainly with something like this you can see how the pieces fit together. So a sketch is really easy to draw, it's basically a handle with a half sphere, but actually fitting a half sphere of copper to a handle of stainless steel, the fit has to be absolutely perfect. Now when you draw it, obviously it looks perfect because you've just drawn some lines, but I think what we found during the, you know, especially making this prototype, is that actually it's quite a tricky thing to do. You, there's some things you can't explain on paper mm. or on the computer screen or whatever. You have to get into the material and just get on with it. Yeah. And also you've changed the way that we produce things because of making this. You changed from using round stock for making handles to square stock because we didn't like the profile of the handle. So you thought, well, we'll, we'll use a different stock. You then worked out that actually you can produce a handle quicker and nicer using a different type of stock. But that has kind of ripples and repercussions for the rest of production. So now we're changing the way we're making the pan handles. Yeah. So we're using a different type of stock, which means we can make them more efficiently. Um, so, you know, we're constantly sort of, in a way, bouncing off our own you know, creativity or our own way of looking for more efficient ways of making things, but without, losing the essence of the product. quite a long process and then the final process is faceting the, the outside so we've got this lovely texture on and that's the kind of that's the point of it in a sense like I said earlier if we were just to get them spun a they would be machine made I mean they'd be a lot cheaper and a lot easier for us and we could make more of them but you can't replicate this texture in any way and each piece will be completely different they'll look basically the same but each one will have its own character, each one will have its own marks. Um, the inside of the bowls have this beautiful texture that you can't, you can't replicate any other way than by actually making it the way that we make it.
I think actually, that, as you said, I didn't know anything at all about coffee making when we turned up at Sean's and actually I left definitely with a new appreciation for coffee and for how it's made, but also the process of brewing coffee and, you know, not buying cheap crap coffee by understanding the processes and by understanding what work goes into it and where the product comes from and the kind of care and attention that goes into making these this lovely product, you come away thinking, well, actually, you want to give that produce a little bit more respect. There's something really honest, I think, about um, the results you get from a very kind of low-fi, hands-on approach compared to something that's been designed for expedience or convenience or whatever, you know, you get the results. It's that Venn diagram of, like, fast, easy... Uh, cheap isn't it it's like yeah. you can't have all three and like the, the good the good stuff especially in coffee just takes time i'd rather take half an hour <laughs> and really appreciate a cup of coffee yeah. than take five minutes and it not taste very nice you know? so yeah because of the, the differences in between each individual coffee you know you've got things like moisture content density size of the beans um all of those sort of elements make a difference to when it's roasted. So each coffee has its own individual roast profile, which um, tells you um, like a starting temperature. So that the temperature that the, the coffee drum is when you've got the, the room temperature green coffee into the drum. The drum then cools quite considerably with that, um, that temperature change. As the roast goes on, the first um, maybe uh, 50% or so is the coffee drying out, moisture being released, and we control airflow and the, because it's a, a gas roaster, the gas input to control temperature. As the coffee start to darken up, caramelize, you get these really lovely aromas that are suddenly released as the coffee start, coffee beans start to turn brown. And then you get to what they call first crack, which is a uh, an actual audible crack you hear as some moisture is being released from the, the coffee beans. Then you're really developing the flavours of those coffees past that point. So you're talking about maybe a minute and a half to three minutes, perhaps past that point, depending on whether you want like a darker, richer, full body espresso roast or a lighter, cleaner uh, filter roast. And then you drop the coffee into the, into the cooling tray out of the drum and that is cooling down to stop to stop the roasting process just like you know baking and putting something in a nice bath or something like that i mean yeah your favorite coffee shop might stock the coffee that they use and they might have you know other coffees potentially that and they think you might like or you know might be a guest option or a filter option or whatever but chances are you know the barista will be able to tell you you know recommend places things you might like yeah um yeah despite <laughs> despite the kind of odd circumstances <laughs> that, that we're doing that in at the moment um more people than ever are brewing from home because they're at home yeah um, so yeah if we can supply them with great coffee that we we think is great then yeah, that, that's the more the better, isn't it? Like, yeah. it's, a, it's a real opportunity to uh, to show people what coffees, what coffees out there, what um, what specialty coffee is. Yeah. When we make a good product, we want to. It goes back to what you were saying about you know a, a thing is only a only becomes a thing when it's used and if we're going to do that we might as well use the best products that we can find locally yeah yeah and i think that's kind of wh where the whole business is moving and what we're excited about a we're excited about making new products new processes you know copper's not a new material for us but we are starting to use it in a slightly newer way mm. um but we're also excited about meeting new producers you know getting into different parts of the whole food world so whether it's food and drink and you know different aspects of it and more yeah. and more specialist um i mean 
for me, I think the, the design process and you know what we did in that process of having a concept going all the way through the tooling to the end product and then going to see Sean with the coffee. That's what you know. The head, you can see the hair is to stand up on my arm. That's what excites me about the business. That's what I want to do. People do often ask, you know, what's your motivation? What do you like doing? Why do you do this? Um, and that is the the reasons because we get excited about what we're making and we get excited about being able to go and use them.